This is a short revision video on economic growth and the economic cycle, which goes with the national economy part of economics AS level with AQA. To be able to achieve economic growth, you need to have adequate demand, whether it be from within the UK itself or from overseas. This demand will absorb the extra goods and services produced, because economic growth is an increase in output, which is an increase in the production of goods and services over time. And there's no point in producing these if you haven't got the demand for them from either within the UK, so local demand, or from overseas, international demand. Obviously, an increase in the demand for goods or services and consumption will lead to an increase in investment because more firms want to have the ability to produce goods and services in the future to supply stuff to meet this excess demand. So that will lead to an even greater increase in aggregate demand because investment is one of the five components that make up aggregate demand. Without this aggregate demand, there will be no investment, which means that there will be no increase in the capacity of the country to produce. Thus, there will be no economic growth. It's really important to be able to know the difference between economic growth and economic recovery, and I've illustrated it here on the production possibility boundary. When the economy is at point A on the PPB, it's not reaching its productive potential, the facts of production are not fully employed. So simply to get from A to B, which the UK is struggling to do at the moment, but that would be economic recovery, it would get to the actual maximum level of output the country has the ability to get. Whilst if we went from B to C, that would be increasing the ability of the UK to produce more goods and services. So that would be increasing the capacity the UK to add to produce, and that's economic growth. I then illustrated this on a Keynesian curve. So you can see here that from AD1 to AD2 we've got economic growth that isn't particularly inflationary. I mean, there's a small rise in price level, but a much greater rise in real output. Whereas from AD2 to AD3, we've got hardly any increase in output, but a massive rise in the price level because there's too much aggregate demand. So there's more demand than the supply that's available, so prices have to rise to get rid of this excess demand. That's a positive output gap, which is obviously inflationary. And what governments will tend to do to reduce this inflation is increase interest rates. Obviously this has benefits and costs and we'll come on to this much later in another video about monetary policy. Now we're going to look at this on the LRAS which obviously shows the ability of the economy to produce goods and services. The maximum total capacity it has to do so. Obviously this is affected by the quantity of the factors of production that are available. So... So countries with larger populations, more resources in the land, they've got a greater ability to produce goods and services because they've got more factors of production. Obviously, productivity is a massive effect on the LRES curve because it's the ability to produce more with the same input, so you get more output from the same input in the same period of time. So if you've got a greater productivity, you've got a greater capacity to produce. And obviously, technology goes hand-in-hand hand with productivity. If you've got better technology, you've probably got higher productivity. And also, technology, it's great to have it, but it's only important if it gets taken up by the firms within the country, because if you've got the technology there but no one's using it, that's a bit pointless. It has absolutely no impact on the LRES curve, so it has to be taken up by firms. So those three factors on the top there will cause there to be a right shift of the LRES curve. And you're probably thinking, what's the benefit of this? Well, let's be honest, you're probably not, but I'm going to tell you anyway. A right shift to the LRES curve leads to lower prices, as you can see there, we're going down the AD curve, an extension of the AD curve, and I've forgotten to label the axis, but if you went across you'll see the price has fallen. More output, obviously, we've gone right along the output line, so increase in output, and therefore the country is more competitive, we've got more goods and services still internationally, and they're cheaper, so it makes us much better to compete on the international market. Obviously we need to take quality into account as well, because there's no good producing extra if it's really low quality, but if we've got good quality goods and services as we tend to have in the UK, and we can get it cheaper, well there we are. We're more internationally competitive, that means we can reduce our balance of trade deficit and stuff like that. Moving on now to the population and economic growth, obviously the population makes up labour, which is one of the factors of production, so it's really important to have a high participation rate, which means there's a large proportion of the country's population that makes up the labour force. And here are different ways to increase the participation rate. Obviously, if we've got an increase in immigration, that's really good, because there's more people in the country, more labour in the country to work, so we've got more labour, so greater capacity to produce. Obviously, there are costs and benefits of immigration, we're not going to go into that, but Obviously, more people come into the country in terms of economics, that's good for the country, at least in terms of shifting the LRAS curve, because we've got people here who are making goods and services increasing our output. If we have an ageing population, that's obviously it's really nice and cute for the old people, but in terms of the LRAS curve, not so good, because these old people, they're sucking up our resources, 
and they're not really contributing to the economy in terms of production. I mean, obviously, ageing populations do contribute to the economy. They do a lot of charity work quite often, lots of voluntary work. But in terms of the LRES curve, they really don't help it because they're not having any positive impact on production. Indeed, it could be deemed that they're having a negative impact because often workers have to take time out of work to look after their ageing grandparents or parents or whatever. So that means they're not actually contributing to the economy. So if we've got a younger population, in terms of the LRES curve, that is better. And finally, the changing expectations of females. I appreciate the wording of there isn't perfect, but if we're thinking about the changing expectations of females, in this country we expect females to work. We don't say, you know, you can be a housewife, sit at home. We say, you know, you get up and participate. Obviously there'll be some housewives, but not as many as in other countries. So we've got a much greater proportion of the population which is contributing to the economy. Whereas in some third world countries, we've got females that just sit at home cooking or something. And although they are making food for their family, they're not actually contributing in terms of the economic supply going into the country, or coming out of the country even. They've got a lower participation rate in that country because they've got less of the country's population making up the labour force, whereas in the UK, if we've got all the females making up the labour force too, you know, working in factories, doing accountancy, doing admin, whatever they do, they are still helping to increase the productive capacity of the economy because we're engaging more of our factors of production in production itself. Productivity leads to increased economic growth because productivity means you're producing more with the same inputs in the same period of time. So countries tend to really want to increase productivity. So how do we increase it? We could use a lot of supply side policies are really good for increasing productivity. We'll look at that later when we do the policies. But improving education, which is indeed a supply side policy, really increases productivity because people have a higher human capital. They probably can produce more in the same period of time if they're like trained to use the machines, they've got a wider knowledge of what's going on so it means they're more likely to be able to fix them, stuff like that. It just increases productivity drastically if you've got educated people running factories, running machines, you suppose you've got educated management, they know how to do things efficiently, save time, stuff like that. But then it's no good having all of these people if they're not flexible in terms of labour. If they Maybe you've got 5,000 accountants and two builders and obviously we need quite a lot more builders than that. So we need to improve labour flexibility by training generally. So people can often be rendered geographically and occupationally immobile, meaning they're stuck in one place which is not where the labour is needed and they haven't got the skills that are needed for labour. If the government can have schemes in place to train these people and get them to where they need to be, maybe make, give them loans and grants to allow them to move to different parts of the country. For example, it's really hard if I, I don't, I don't live in Manchester, but if I lived in Manchester and I moved to London, there's a massive difference there in the cost of housing. So if the government helped me with that, I'd be more likely to move and therefore contribute to the economy. Obviously, that would be increasing the participation rate. Technical advances. They are great for increasing productivity because if we've got a machine that can make 50 things in an hour and a machine that can make 100 things in an hour, the machine that makes 100 things in an hour is far more efficient. It's using its time much more efficiently and obviously it's making more using its inputs within that time period. And finally, investment into growing industries. If we put investment into industries that are currently growing, it means they can grow much faster to meet the rising demand for whatever they're producing. If we put all of our investment into, like, I don't know what sort of companies we'd put it into, maybe plot plant, plot plant, pot plant, I can't say that, pot plant uh, industries, I mean, there's no real boom for pot plants, whereas there's a massive increase in demand for mobile phones and stuff like that. If we put it into that industry, it will be much more effective than if we put it into the pot plant industry, which really isn't seeing a massive boom at the moment. Well, I suppose it might be. I just always use that example because I'm sat right next to a pot plant, which is quite a big pot plant, actually. What's it called? Madagascar dragon tree. Classy. Except it's kind of dead, so that's not really such a good thing. I mean, we've seen this diagram already today. We're going to look at it in more detail, so the position on the PPB itself. Obviously at A we've already discussed this, we're below our economic capacity because we've actually got the ability to produce much more if we actually manage to get to the PPB itself, onto the frontier itself. But unfortunately for some reason we're not reaching that level, maybe we're not fully engaging the labour we've got, maybe we're not really using all of our land, stuff like that. Then we have B and C, they're completely different positions on the curve. At B we are producing much more 
capital goods, which means that maybe the materialistic standard of living for people in the country won't be so good, but an increase in capital goods means that in the future we're going to have a greater capacity to produce more consumer goods, more goods and services. So whilst short-term opportunity cost is consumer goods, long-term we'll actually be able to produce more goods and services, maybe they'll be of a better quality, maybe they'll have a lower average cost if we've increased our productivity, so that'll be a cheaper price for the consumer, stuff like that. Obviously, if in the future we're going to get this increased capacity, that is economic growth, which has loads of benefits, as we discussed in the previous video, I think. At C, we have loads of consumer goods, which is really good short term, because materialistically everyone's better off, everyone's like, woo, loads of consumer goods, way. But long term, it means that we might actually fall behind on the international market. If other countries have put their money and their investment into capital goods, they're spending their money on capital goods, now they've got a much better capacity to produce goods and services, they can do it cheaper and more effectively, cost efficiently. And we haven't got that ability because we've put all of our money into consumer goods. We're going to lag behind, which could lead to an increased balance of trade deficit. Obviously, the ideal would get a compromise of both of these two, which is D. So we'll get more consumer goods and more capital goods in terms of where we were before on A. Obviously, it's quite hard to get to D because that means actually pushing out our production possibility frontier, shifting it outwards. And that is quite a hard thing to do because it means finding more factors of production. So maybe an increase in immigration would be really good because we have more labour, so we'd have a like, greater capacity to produce these goods and services. So there's a lot we have to do to shift it outwards. It's basically the same as the LRES curve, shifting it outwards. What do we have to do? That's what we want to do if we want to get the best of both worlds. Best of both worlds. Sorry, I just couldn't resist. You can probably tell why my singing career didn't really rock it into the sky. The saddest part of that singing was that I actually sounded like I was trying, which can I assure you I wasn't, but even if I was trying I probably wouldn't do much better. So now we're going to apply all of the stuff we've done now to the AD slash AS model. Obviously we've got our long aggregate supply curves and our short aggregate supply curves drawn separately here, rather than having a Keynesian supply curve, which some of you might be more used to. So you might be more used to this diagram, you may be more used to the other diagram. I think in terms of showing all the different effects it has, it's easiest to show it on this diagram. Earlier we discussed why economic growth, the increase in aggregate demand stuff, led to an increase in investment. So that will lead to an increase in the AD, that's a right shift of the curve, simply because investment is one part of the AD curve, it makes up part of the AD, because we've got consumption, government spending, investment, and exports minus imports. So that is why aggregate demand will shift right if we have economic growth. We said that investment came from economic growth and investment will eventually lower a firm's costs because it will lead to stuff like increased productivity which leads to lower average costs because you can pay the workers the same amount even though they're producing more in the same period of time so that will lower firm's costs which is a right shift to the SRES curve because it means that more firms are actually able to enter the market and firms find it more profitable to produce more so they'll produce more and more goods and services so that will be a right shift to that curve. And finally, the LRES curve will shift because our investment leads to an increase in economic capacity. So we've got the ability to produce more goods and services because we've increased our productivity, our capital, stuff like that. So that's a right shift of the LRES curve, similar to the outward shift of the PPB, actually. So this is the diagram here, which shows all of the lovely impacts of an increase in investment coming from a rise in economic growth. And then from this diagram we can show that the price has remained at the same level, the price level hasn't changed, so there's been no inflation, but we've seen a, actually there's a tiny bit of inflation I think, but that's just because of how I've drawn it, I mean you could draw it in lots of different ways, but the way I've drawn it there really isn't very much inflation, but there's a massive increase in economic growth, we're producing more goods and services, we're supplying more greater output, so that is all of the stuff we've done here really shown on one diagram. And that is the end of this short video on economic growth. Hopefully you've learnt something and I didn't actually, like, kill anyone who had their headphones on whilst I was singing. Join us next time for a short video on employment and unemployment. Woo! Have a lovely day. Bye-bye!